get into the word today. Somebody say dealing with desire. So today we're going, I'm going to go to, to the book of James in a minute. Um, so you can go ahead and flip over to James or, you know, your apps or your phone, whatever you do, uh, to James. And I'm going to come there in just a second. Um, but I want to talk about desire. Now this one is going to be some, uh, I hope you wore some boots today. Because this one is probably going to be on some toes. But that's okay. Am I allowed to preach the word? Because I'm here to tell you, going to church today is generally about what the people want and not what God wants. And God wants to talk about things that some people don't want to discuss. And we're going to get all up in that so that we, you know, the hardest messages are the healthiest messages. The hardest messages are the healthiest messages. And so we want to make it like, hey, if we got this time together, let's, let's just go ahead and get into it. Ain't no point in lying about it. And, and there's no point in tiptoeing around it. So we're going to get into some areas today. It won't all be hard, but we're going to get into some areas. I hope you got a notepad or something. So we're going to start this new message series on desires. And we're going to talk about things about, like, how to govern your desires. Because, you know, your, your desires can't run your life. Desires are a concept that a lot of people don't really understand. You know, they, they know they have them. You, you know you have cravings. You know you have wants. You know you have tastes for things. People don't always know what to do with them, how to deal with them. And if you look at the world, you know, desires are running things. And so um, we want to talk about how desires are used, in fact, because desires are very important. Desires, how they're used to create things. Desires have a part in creating things intending things what desires illustrate our intentions for things desires uh they shape and build reality so when you start thinking about the concept which is what we're going to kind of deal with a little bit today then we're going to get into specific areas of how to deal with it over the next few weeks but desires actually relate to a lot of things like the release of the presence of god the release of the presence of god the oil of god many times is connected to the right desire. The activity of your desire will create a framework by which God can flow through. Your desires will cause you to build a vessel for the oil to be put in. Right? So if you don't have that desire, you won't create or form the framework that God wants you to, to build, and you have to have His desires his intentions, plans, and blueprints so that you appropriately build a vessel that God wants to fill up. Because if your desire was met today, where would you put it? You want more of God's power, but where would you put it? You can't put that power in that mindset. God couldn't put what he wants to put in you without the appropriate vessel. So desire is the blueprint by which we create the right vessel. And if you want the flow of the oil or the wine, then you have to be able to create the right thing, which all begins with desires. Somebody say desire. So the release of the oil, the power of the kingdom, and how the things that manifest in our lives, how do they arrive? They, they first arrive based on a desire, good or bad. Evil desires will eventually produce evil manifestations. Holy desires, righteous desires, royal desires will eventually produce a kingdom and a culture of the kingdom in the earth. A lot of people don't know what to do with those desires because there's a war between your desires. The desires of your flesh, the desires of your carnal mind, the desires of the natural realm versus the desires of the kingdom. It's going back and forth inside your spirit. Today, So I, like part one in a series, I like to set up and build like a foundation for us to move in for the rest of the teachings going forward. But you have to start to understand we are going to talk about this word desire over and over again. The other thing about desires, it's an extremely powerful force. I want you to write these little words down. It is an extremely, I can't even, as a matter of fact, that word is not sufficient to describe the power of this idea called a desire, a craving. It's not, the word extremely powerful, the phrase, is not sufficient 
Because people will do things based on a desire that you would not believe. And that they not always necessarily want to do. So desires will drag you away from the things of God, the purposes of God, and the crown of life. It'll drag you away. Desires will grab you by your collar and drag you to things. And drag you far away from good things. Far away from reason. Holy reasoning. God's reasoning. The wisdom of heaven. Your desires will drag you away from that. You should be able to, listen, you need to respect desire. Don't play with the ideas of desire. It's a very, very powerful thing. It will completely take over your life. Let's read James chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 12. Are y'all there? Online, are you there? Type it in the box and let us know. Blessed is the man, verse 12, who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. This is very important scriptures right here. Tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does himself tempt anyone, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away or dragged away, some translations use, away by his own desire. So when you are tempted, how are you tempted? You are tempted by the things you desire. Your desire is dragging you and enticing you for things. You can't be tempted by things you don't want. You can't be tempted by things you don't want. So we have to find out why do I want these things and should I want these things is it appropriate to want these things? And if it is not, how do I deal with these things that I want but shouldn't want? Woo, hallelujah. I feel the anointing coming in here. I'm going slow. Can y'all give me some time today? Yeah, because see, people, a lot of times they feel these certain feelings and they don't understand them. But I'm here to tell you, your, your um, desires, verse 14, is the thing that is being used to tempt you and dragging you away and verse 15 then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin uh oh and so so when do you sin do you sin because you wanted it no that's not when it happens that's not when it happens see people think because you had a thought or because there was a there was a, a impulse that that's the sin part no sin is born on the back side of your desire See, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So here we go. We got this process happening where I desired something and I didn't deal with it until it was destroying things. I should have dealt with it when I wanted it. I should have dealt, I should have got help. I should have went to God. I should have went to the Word. I should have went to someone, somewhere. I should have got help when I had the taste for that. I shouldn't have waited until it grew up because once it grows up, the Bible says once it's conceived, this word, I, this idea conceived uh, actually is the word for entrapment or to put you in chains or cages or bondage. In other words, once it grows up, you become a slave to it. You chase after it. And then once you get it, it grows up, and then you are now being dragged around like a slave to it. Even when you're ready to let it go, it's not ready to let you go. Right? So we got this process going on, and people don't know because most people are dealing with things when it's over here destroying things. We don't even look at it until something starts going down. We should have looked at it when we wanted it. Say amen. So he says now, and I'll, I'll read some more of this later, but we don't want to let it grow up and start destroying. Every time you see something being destroyed, 
It's not just being destroyed because for no reason. It has actually gone through a process. And by the time your relationship is being destroyed, you could follow it back to a place in your mind where you started thinking about it. Because desire is in your mind. It's in your heart. It's in your, it's in your soul. The soul is the, 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 the desire is in the soulish realm. So when you have that, and the, and the soul is the governing seat of your life, your heart. If a desire gets in there, it becomes a ruler. And so before we get, I want to give you some ideas here, but before we get too far into this, I hope you're writing notes. Before we get too, in, too far into the idea of desire and why it is so powerful, let, write down some of these ideas I want to give you. This is powerful concepts right here. All of the world, all of the world, all of the systems of the world, every nation, think of a map and all the nations, every culture, every type of culture, whether it's a national ethnic group or maybe it's just even a, a, you know, a culture at a job or companies or whatever the case might be, every culture, every nation, and every world, every business, all economies, every product that's made, every service that is rendered is built off of a desire. In other words, nations exist because there was a desire for an idea and a group of people to get together. There is no try to understand some concepts. Sometimes it seems a little bit, um, you know, heavy or, or kind of deep when I say certain things. But try to grab some of these concepts. Nations, in a sense, when we see the words of the name of the nations, you know, I, I usually say this when I travel, like whatever nation I'm in, I say there's no such thing as America or Africa. Well, that's not a nation, but, you know, Nigeria. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no such place as Honduras. There's no place. There's no, sur- there's no such thing. And you're sitting in this nation, right? And they're like, there's no place. I, aren't I sitting in it? No, you're not. It's all a mental uh, construct. There's no, there's no Honduran dirt. There's no American dirt land. You know what I mean? There's no American oceans or seas or fish. You can't pull a fish out of a, an American stream and it sounds American and speaks American. And you can't pull one out of a China Sea and it speaks Chinese. But we call it that, right? But what is it actually? It is a desire for a way of life that we have named after something or someone. It's not an actual place. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It all is actually part of the kingdom of heaven. But we desired a certain lifestyle and we desired a certain things to be righteous and certain things to be not righteous. We desired a certain culture. We desired a certain thing to be in and out of bounds. And then once you get a group of people together, that forms a group or a people or a nation and now they have constituted themselves and then it expands. So, so there's no such thing as these. What is it? It is essentially a desire that has been manifested. That's it. That's it. So if you can change the desires of a nation, you can change the nation. The name label might be still on it, America, but it could still be the kingdom of heaven. If you could change the desire of the people. Everything is built on desire. Every business is built to meet a need and a desire. Restaurants know people have a desire to eat. And they know you have a desire to eat a certain food. So they build something according to your desire. They don't build it. If you're a good business person, you don't build it according to your desire. You build it according to what they want. So you find out what they want. You build something that meets what they want and you serve it to them. And now you have a customer. And that's how it all works. Governments are built that way. Voting has to do with desires. Who do you want to see in office? So we have a system so your desire can be heard. Think of the power of desire. Well, what do you want? Who do you want to run the country? What laws? Guys, we write laws to meet desires. Well, we prefer in desire that when we own things, people don't steal them. So we have laws against that. A law is proof of a desire. It's an intended outcome. What do you want to see? What type of world do you want to live in? These are all desire-based. And you can see desire is driving the laws, isn't it? Desire is driving government, isn't it? The, the democratic government style 
is the desires of the people. The kingdom government is the desires of the king. So you, in a kingdom, they govern based on the desires of the king. Nobody else's desires matter. Think of this system. How, how can you now serve God, which is a king, and live in a kingdom effectively when your whole life was based on what do you want? What do you want? What do you want to see in church today? What kind of message would you like me to preach today? I could have all of y'all come around when I'm doing my sermon planning and praying, and I could just skip all of that and say, what do you want me to preach? Just tell me. Send me a letter. I'll preach what you want to hear. We'd probably be triple the size if I do that. Everything would go up. We'd be in heaven, wouldn't we? And, you know, I'm here to tell you. So if, you, if you're getting my flow today, you got to understand. Everything that's happening on the earth is a bunch of trying to meet people's desires because that is how you keep people loyal. That's how you keep them married. People are not married because God wants healthy marriages and healthy families and healthy children and healthy communities so that he can birth his kingdom through it as a model. That's, that's, not, what, that's not why people get married. Most people get married because I wanted him and she wanted him and he wanted her. It all had to do with your desire. Then one of y'all gets saved. One. The other person is like, now I want what God wants. And this person is like, yeah, but I still want this. Like, but you got to let that go. And they're like, no, this is what I want. I said, but this is what God wants. And now you got one person wanting what God wants and one person wanting what they want. I can see this is going to be like tilling the hard soil today. Everything is, listen, I'm trying to, I'm trying to really drive this point in i want you to see the world men are trying to satisfy desire mankind they're trying to satisfy desire they're not they're not really even tuned in to what god wants at all and the saddest part is the church part because this is the part where god's will should be communicated and and even if it's a tough subject we should be able to just talk about it but i've heard i've heard pastors get up all the time you hear it too they get up and they just say what they think they just say, you know what it is? They just say what they think that people want to hear. And then somewhere along the line, they feel like their opinion matters. And so they get up, instead of communicating what the Bible is saying, and which there's some tough guys, there are some tough things in here that I'm like, Lord, I'm like the disciples, this is a hard thing. Lord, this is a hard thing you have said, but yet, nevertheless, this is what you want. I mean, there's some, there's some stuff, it's not easy to say that it's right. You might not even know why it's right, but it's what God said. Can I keep going? So everything is built based on desire. Say that. Say everything is built based on desires. Do you see how that's the construct, the foundation and the construction of society? We're getting down to the root of this concept, okay? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see everything through that lens. So everything that's invested, all the energy that it takes, every political business, social thing, every movement, every, everything that you see has to have a lot of energy, time, and thought, and money put into it, invested into it. And all of that is pushed in because they desire to see that thing succeed. Right? Think about this. I use entertainment as an example because entertainment, the entertainment industries are proof that people want entertainment more than they want anything else. They want it more than anything else because it, your money follows it, your attendance follows it, your attention follows it. And so those entities have not only the money, they also have the influence because they have the money. Right? Because wherever you see success and fame and, and money and all this, you see you're, you're, you're mesmerized and hypnotized by that success. And so you also give them your ear. Because think about it. Entertainment... For example, the sporting arena. There are people that every year I watch this, right? And every year there are like football players and basketball players and they offer them $40 million or something, right? To run around and play with a ball, right? $40 million. And then some of them have the nerve to say, I'm going to hold out. I ain't coming until it's $50 million. Now who pays them that salary? Isn't it the fans? 
the tickets, the merchandise, the attention, the TV ratings. Isn't that where the money comes from? So that tells you our desire to see you run around is why you can demand $50 million instead of 40. Wasn't $40 million a lot? Most people will never see $40 million in a lifetime. If you live 10 lifetimes, you wouldn't see $40 million. They will say, $40 million? I, I'm going to push that away until I get 50. But what? see, our desire to be entertained is what creates that market. I still have not, you know, most churches, 90-something percent of churches in America are less than 100 people. You, all you see is the big ones. 90%, the biggest majority of work being done in the body of Christ is being done by churches that are a few hundred or less. I have yet to meet one of those pastors that said, you know what? We have an issue. We're making $40 million a year. But the money is out there. It's just going to entertainment. It's not that the money is not available. It's just that people's desires is directing the money. 40 minutes. So this is just a small example. Now, if you shut down every sporting event, nothing would happen. If all sports went away, nothing would change. But if you shut down churches, everything would change. Because this is not just a, you know, bricks and mortar. This is a spiritual entity. And so if God doesn't have people's attention and their desires set on him and we're focusing on this, then immoral, you think it's immoral now? We are the last line of defense. Every week we're trying to pull people away from those desires back into what God wants for them. And we're trying to do it with people who can't sing, can't play, ain't loyal, won't stay on schedule, won't give. Our, our people can sing. I'm speaking as a, in general. Churches have to win the championship with mediocre players. Not even mediocre. Sometimes just straight terrible. Ain't loyal. Can't count on them. They get the sniffles. They won't come in. Yeah, I'm preaching. Won't give. Stingy. And we still got to save the world. But all these other people got to do is... Forty million. Here you go. People are literally dying and going to hell. And we'd rather give the money to this. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now, Excel Church, we got good singers and musicians, okay? Uh, I'm being general. I'm being general. Yeah. Oh, I got some stuff I would say as a pastor. I better leave that alone. Let me just tell y'all some, some, some things here. When your desire is at a certain level, your resources do follow it. And just because you want something does not mean you should go after it. I think so. I'm always a big fan of the church, regardless of some of the bad ones that are out there. I'm still, I'm all, because God is a fan of the church, so I'm going to be with, on what God is on. That's right. Regardless, okay? So I'm never going to shun the church. It's the hope of the world. Amen. The church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the only place you're going to get the truth. It's the only place that carries the anointing. It's the only place. God said, I will give the keys of the kingdom to the church. And we're going to take the wisdom of the world, and we're going to confuse them with the wisdom of, of God through the church. It's a powerful thing. So, the desires that we have, now you got to think about what this means. Desires are essentially things that you want that you don't have, feelings that you want to feel, but you haven't felt or haven't felt it in a while. So these things are triggering your desires. Things we want to see, but we have not yet seen. Things we would like to experience in this physical scene realm that 
uh, you know, it drives all of the actions and the energies that we do. It's just really us trying to chase a feeling, chase, you know, an experience, chase something that we'd like to see, you know. We get these desires and we want, and, and again, not all of that is bad, but we have to start to learn how to regulate desires, how to categorize them, how to know which ones are right or wrong, how to put and prioritize them. Amen. There's a lot that goes on with this. Desires though, are dragging people around everywhere, dragging us into bondage, making us pursue things we shouldn't want. Now, can I step on some toes if I didn't already? So I'm going to tell you in a minute where some of the desires come from, but, you know, some people, they want things so badly that they will literally take anything to, to get the feeling. Like, why do people want to lay in the bed with somebody just so they can have somebody to lay with. I'm not even talking about the physical action of sex right now. I'm just, I'm just talking about some people are tired of rolling over and seeing pillows. Hugging pillows. Right? Some people are so tired of that and they want, they want a physical person there so badly, they'll almost take anything. Any visitor. Anybody. Yeah, a visitor. I mean, he could just stay for two nights and be gone. As long as you get the feeling, as long as you get the feeling. So we just are chasing the feelings. We're not even chasing the purpose of a person being there. What is the real intention of having a relationship? It doesn't matter. I just need the feeling that I had one, even if it wasn't real or even if it was wrong. I just got to get because I had this feeling and I have to satisfy this feeling. I have a compulsion that I need to satisfy. It's a psychological thing to try to satisfy these urges. When really, see, I know this. Men and women are completely different. Men are chasing a feeling. Men can be with a woman. Once he gets the feeling he was after, he can literally leave and forget the person's name. He can be talking to his friends, and they say, who was you with last night? He said, he'll go, um, um, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And if he don't go back, he may never remember that name. Because the whole time he was, he was learning your name, he wasn't even listening. As long as he gets the feeling, it's going to be okay. I just want the feeling, and I'm gone. And they're wondering why he ain't staying. Because he satisfied his desire. That's why it's really important before you get married to someone, you need to know their desires. What do you want? What do you want from me? Do you want some feelings? Do you want me to satisfy your flesh? Is that what you want? Is that all you want? What else do you He's going to lie, by the way, I'm telling you. So he's going to give you some little deep answer. Because, by the way, men are very charming. And we learn how to use that charm. And, and what's funny is that, you know, by the time you satisfy that desire, I hope to God you haven't picked up something you can't get rid of. Now you're leaning on Jesus for a miracle. See, this is, this is the truth, isn't it? But why would we go through all of that? And why would we chase something so passionately? And why would we want that so badly? It's because there is a desire under there. And for the men, do the exact same thing, except for men, don't, we don't have a connection to the individual. Men can literally, because a lot of times your desires are, are motivated by your design. If you're designed for a certain thing, you tend to want to do that. Men are designed to populate nations. So a man can be ready to procreate every couple of hours. Every day. Once a woman gets pregnant, she can't get pregnant again for whatever after six or eight weeks after the pregnancy is over. But a man can impregnate a woman every day. And you wonder where all these babies are coming from. He's just trying to fulfill that desire. He don't know what to do with it. He don't know how to control himself. He don't know when it's appropriate, when it's not. It's just the desire. He, nobody's ever taught him or he just says the desire is so strong. I have to get this feeling that I have satisfied that desire. The monster has to eat. 
I got to feed the beast. Some people are the same way with food. I have to eat. Stop eating. I have to eat. Why are you eating? They're, eat, they're eating so much, they don't even know when they're eating. It's like, do you realize you're still eating? And I'm just so hungry. Cravings. I have so many cravings. Why do people chase alcohol and drugs and things like this? It's because when you have a desire, your flesh has a desire, you have to find an outlet to satisfy that monster. That's how powerful desires are. And we will do anything. Listen to this. Why do governments corrupt? Why do they corrupt? Governments corrupt because people have a desire for things like power, control, Listen, you dying is no skin off of their back. They don't know you. They see numbers and statistics. Well, this many people died and this many people are in poverty and this many people. That doesn't affect them. That desire is controlling that decision. The desire is controlling it. So if a person is, has a desire that's out of control, you're going to see countries out of control, people out of control, people chasing things around that they shouldn't be chasing around. This is why, when in terms of relationships, in kingdoms, all relationships generally were arranged. It's because it keeps your desires out of the equation. So I don't, I don't want you to try to arrange or go tell somebody, I had a dream about you. The Lord has arranged for us. This is what I believe about this. One, when it comes to relationships, people, I believe all marriages, first of all, let's start with Jesus. Your marriage to Christ was arranged. Whether you love him or not, he loves you. This is an arrangement between two relationships that were destined to do business together and rule and reign together. Your relationship with God has nothing to do with your love for him. It has to do with a political and life decision. You will learn to love him. You don't need to love him today. You need to be smart today. You need to know who to get with. Yes. See, what y'all do is fall in love with someone when you really should ignore your desires and you should get with someone that is wise. See, I believe that God arranges types of people to be with, not people. Right. Types of people, because people say, well, the Lord showed me this individual. And maybe you do marry that person. But in most cases, I don't believe that that's the case. Because I, what I believe is that there's a type. So if you have, I've had people when I used to be at my former church before I planted this one. I had people coming up to me because I was on staff as a pastor. And they would tell me that God told them that they're supposed to marry the preacher. I said, he's married. And then we had one preacher that, that I was on staff with. He wasn't married. And they would tell me him. And I would just say, listen. I don't think this is true. And their hearts will just be crushed. No, but I'm having dreams about it. That's because you're lusting about it. You wish you had a man like that. Therefore, that imagery is in your head. And you ain't having prophetic dreams. You need to deal with that. And be ashamed. There is healthy shame. You need to be ashamed in that way in some things. Shun, and you need to shun it. So, so I would tell them, i say, you know... Maybe God is just telling you at, at the best is that a type of man, you see the qualities of an individual, and that's what's drawing you to that because those are your desires as a mirror in front of you. Are you understanding desire? So you can't go after, because what happens is the more you desire something, it, it turns into these things like lust, coveting, where you want things that don't belong to you. And you'll, and you'll literally desire what desires will do. They'll make you rob, cheat, steal, and kill. It'll make you lie to people to get what you want. You ever lie to someone just to get what you want? Yeah. And, and, and listen, don't think that the world is not lying to get what they want from you. So they don't even tell you the truth. But people lie, cheat, steal just to get the things that they want. That's Desires, as we're talking about this, I'm just thinking, how big is this topic? It's huge. That's why we did the graphic with the flames on it, because desire is like a burning, consuming fire that you need to learn how to deal with. But you know what? There is a website that I want to share with you. There's a website that monitors global desire. Did you know that? It's called Google. 
Because when people desire stuff, they look for it. And this is the global search engine of the world. So I did some research. And I found out that if you go to Google and you research top Google searches of the, of the year 2022, you're going to see like the top three are like YouTube and Facebook and translation uh, websites where people are trying to translate words for languages and travel. So these are like the top two or three. But did you know in the top 15, there are four times ranking in the top 15 pornography. Do you know who drives pornography? Men. The men drive the industry of pornography. And pornography is so powerful that the people that are ranking in the top 15, four different times in the top 15, that on their statistics, it shows zero ad spend, zero marketing to rank that high globally. Not U.S., globally. Four times globally with no ad spend. This means that people want that fleshly desire uh, satisfied so much, especially men, that they don't even need to advertise it. They just need to create it because you will find it. I told you I'm stepping on some toes. This, This is not about pornography, but it is about the appetite of the flesh. Which if it's ranked four times and just under YouTube, church is not even in the top 25. Not even, Jesus is not even in the top 25. But pornography is there four times. It's number four just under YouTube and Facebook and translation. Can you just think of that for one second? And it didn't make the hit the list once. It made it four times. And this is what I know. See, Pastor, are you talking about those touchy subjects again? Listen, I'm, I'm glad that we can't see in each other's heads. Because your neighbor watches pornography. On a large scale. And maybe it's not the one beside you. Maybe it's the one behind you. <laughs> or the one in front of you. Or the one in your house. Or maybe you got a pornogra- pornographic website on right beside this one in another tab. Because it's looking for you. Now They're not paying money. All they got to do is create it. So the women are the people that are the actors or actresses. It's not acting. You're just doing it. There's no, they're giving awards to these people. Just think of, look, the glorification, just, just for a desire. Not only do I need this feeling and I need the money, I also need a trophy. Award ceremonies for people like this. And so here's what's coming next. They're going to put it in front. It's going to be mainstream, which it already is. And you start knowing these people's names and stuff. When it used to be a very, very secret, you know, it was always big, but it used to be secret and not famous. So the men are paying for it. Why? Because they want the feeling. And hey, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna help you out with this. Sexual desire is a big one. So I'm talking about it a little bit more. I'll tell you the secret. I went to God. Years ago, I had a guy ask me a question. And I said, let me pray about it and come back to you. It was about why men are so driven to that. I said, let me, I want to go get a better answer. I want to think about it. So I prayed about it. And I thought about it. And I thought about all the marriage counseling I do. And I thought about all the relationship stuff that I do. Are y'all still here? And, I, and the Lord gave me... One powerful reason, why do men, why are men so driven? Ladies, listen to this. Why are men so driven to pornography? This might not hit you, but it should. It's because in pornography, none of the women resist them. Men can be married, but the wife is always having to be begged. Come on, babe, please. Come on, babe, please. Come on, babe, tonight. Come on, babe. Come on, babe. I'm tired. Come on, babe. Man, y'all leave me up here by myself. But I listen, I, I know the game. Look, come on, babe. We just did it yesterday. That was yesterday. And so guess what? They get tired of being rejected. Because when they turn on the TV 
and the computer, these women do it, and they love to do it for him. And so he goes where he's respected, and he goes where he's not rejected. So not understanding desires will cause you to put up barriers where you need to be the one to help with that desire. Because it ain't going away. And then the woman is going to be the person she's now. So the man wants it and the woman wants a different part of it. So she's going to get a few dollars for it. But she likes to be affirmed and told she's pretty and you're beautiful. And she wants these words and these, these fake relationships. And so you got this huge industry building and building and building and destroying marriages and destroying men and women and destroying sex drives and destroying communities and destroying faithful people who would otherwise look. They had a, a slip up or a mishap. You know why? They just wanted some. I remember counseling this one lady, y'all. She got so irritated at me. Me and my wife, was, we, we was doing a marriage counseling. The, the guy cheated on the girl. They were older. They were a little bit older. So it wasn't like a new marriage. And we, and we listened. We went through our, you know, our whole thing. And at the end, I just got so irritated with, with, with the baloney. You know what I'm saying? And I told the woman, after I got the evidence first, didn't we? We got the evidence. We talked about it. I said, I said, it doesn't justify anything, ma'am, but you just ain't giving it up. She said, <laughs> I said, well, I don't know how else to say this to you, but after hearing the story... This is crap. He's wrong. We already, we already established that. He's getting his punishment. But you ain't going to walk out of here and act like it was okay what you was doing. And my wife was like, yes, true, and amen, miss. She couldn't believe the answer. I was like, well, y'all can pretend like it don't exist, and y'all can walk around the house, stop touching each other, and stop being with each other because y'all mad at each other. Y'all can walk around like it ain't a thing. Or we can get to the bottom of it. And there's reasons why she wouldn't give it to him. But we need to get to the bottom of that. If you were raped and you don't, and that's an awkward place for you, we need to deal with that. If you have, you know, uh, abuse problems, we need to deal with that. But you can't deprive a desire. A desire will blow up. If you wait until that desire is full grown, that marriage will be destroyed. Amen, Pastor Mike, for saying what needed to be said. And I told her straight up, I was like, I'm sorry, man, but you, you, just, ain't, you just ain't giving it to him. That's why I have my wife there. Because I wouldn't dare say that by myself. I wouldn't even meet with a woman by myself. Can I keep going or is that too heavy for y'all? Y'all looking around, y'all looking around like, I know you ain't. <laughs> well, going back home with your, your, your marriage all in shambles just because desires are unmet. She got desires too. But I can tell you right now, if you guys don't start trying to, trying to work out and negotiate how to get those desires met, it's going to blow up. It's going to blow up. Her desire is not going to be sex though. She, every once in a while she wants that. Twice a month. <laughs> I mean, where she wants it. Why are the ladies laughing like that? Twice a month, you look good. <laughs> it's a hard, fellas, it's hard out here. <laughs> the other times... She is kind of in between, like, okay, okay, maybe I can get in the mood. And then, and then the rest of the time, it's just mercy. She's having mercy on you. Go ahead. <laughs> Unmarried people better listen to me. Desires are a ticking time bomb, people. And so, and so the men, you have to, you have to, you have to deal with your, your, natural inclination to get that feeling and, and move on and she wants some conversations maybe not even right after but just in life she wants some some a good conversation boy a good conversation is good isn't it 
It's a good, I mean, it's a good thing to have a real good. That's why when you guys first get together, it's just the conversating part. It is good. It's so cool to laugh with somebody and have a good chat. You know what I mean? It is. A relationship. Date days and nights. And dress up and let's go out. Honey. Get pretty. Give her some money. All of these things. You know what I'm saying? She's got these desires that she needs. And she and the only place that she really is supposed to get it is you. And so you got to be there. This is not a marriage conference, but this is a huge. The reason why I had to stop on it today is because it's so high on the list. It's killing everything. It's killing everything. We should be having more sex. <laughs> and more. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I'm trying to get my quote out there. More sex, okay? It's healthy for the marriage. And we need more dates. And we need more talking that is not related to sex. Man, that's going to be really hard for us. All talking is trying to get to sex. All, almost all of it. That or what time is food? What time is dinner? Food and sex is basically it. Men don't have a lot of buttons to push. But you need more. You got to have more sex and you got to have more time together and you got to have more talking. You got to do that. Because these desires are going to destroy. I think that, I wonder how many marriages could have been saved just off of that conversation right there. I wonder how many prior, if we could have got to it earlier, and somebody could have told you this earlier, and that it's not a dirty thing, that the Bible wants the marriages to be hot. Me and my wife have never done a marriage conference. And there's reasons for that, but sometimes I want to do one. Because... The stuff that I say up here, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We hear crazy stories, man, sometimes. And I'm like, gosh, that could have been solved so easily. That could have been solved so easily. How much time do I have left? I, got, I can't stop on sex. Let me go. <laughs> let me read a few scriptures or something. Let me show Okay, let me show you because it leads. I, I'm, I'm going to move on from that. I hope you guys got that. If you're single or married, please don't just get with somebody to satisfy a feeling. Please don't do that. Get with some, you have to make sure that the desires match. And you need a lot of counseling between the wedding versus getting to know someone. Okay, so mankind was born sharing this connection with God to rule. That's why he desires these certain things. He desires the things that is put in him by design. And when that was separated... Man still desires it, but now he gets it through other means and controls other things and other people. And, that, and that's, when you have that desire to rule something, it fleshes out in many different ways, but the desires just grow deeper. And they're insatiable. You can't stop them. You can't, you can't feed it enough. It just, it's like a clock. It never goes away. And then so you get more desperate, more desperate, and more desperate to meet those things. But God's desire is what you have to start to focus on. The church has to get fo back, uh, focused on what pleases God. What pleases God? I'll tell you one quick thing, and then I have a few other things I want to tell you. But put up Luke chapter 12 really quick. It's, it's important that you know some, some very pivotal foundational things, okay? Luke chapter 12, 31, seek the kingdom of God. Remember, Google said, and you know this, whatever you want, you'll find it, won't you? You'll find it. You'll search for it. So seek the kingdom of God. If you don't desire the kingdom of God, there's a reason for that. And all these things shall be added to you. So in other words, when you seek the kingdom of God, God becomes the one that satisfies you. And it says, do not fear, little flock. What pleases God? It is the Father's good pleasure. This satisfies God. It's his desire to give you what? The kingdom. Why? Because giving you the kingdom... Is giving you him. 
It's giving you God himself so that when you get the kingdom with that, that's not a place that you get or a bank account size. You know, the, getting the kingdom means the bank account goes up or getting the kingdom means that this happens or that happens. No, getting the kingdom means you literally have the mentality of God. And in that you get the desires of God because desires are in the mind. You get your mind renewed. And when your mind is renewed to the things of the kingdom or the spirit, you are able to now walk out the desires of God on the earth. Because if you walk according to the flesh, the Bible says, put, put up my um, scripture, guys. I, I skipped that one. I want to show you all this one, too. Um, Galatians 5, 17. Go there. It, For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary to each other. But if you are led by the spirit... You are not under the law. You have to be, your desires have to be for spiritual things. If you're going to be free, your desires have to be, why, why is your taste buds so carnal? That's the question. Why do you want things that are evil and forbidden? I'm going to tell you why. Because you you'll start to do something with those. This is why. One, because you're not crucifying those desires. You're glorifying them and making room for them. But here's the other reason. It's because you're spiritually immature. Because here's what happens. The more you seek the kingdom, you get the mind of God. You start to grow spiritually. The kingdom of God, the desires of the kingdom, the desire for justice, the desire for righteousness, the desire to give, the desire to love right, the desire for good relationships, the desire for God's wisdom, the desire for his heart, for his mind, not just what's in his hand. That grows as you seek the kingdom. And as you seek the kingdom, you grow into a man or a woman, a grown-up, into spiritual things. And when you are spiritually minded, you desire the things of the spirit more than the things of the natural. When you won't let go of something material, it's because you are spiritually immature. And if you don't develop the mind of Christ, you'll never be a giver in any sense. You'll never be selfless enough to meet your wife's needs. Because when you are spiritually immature, you're selfish. Selfishness is just another way to say I want to survive and take care of my needs first. But when you have your needs met and you are spiritually full, then you are able to reverse that and become a giver now. And then the Bible says that him who waters others will be watered. So then how can you be unsatisfied if you are always trying to meet the needs of someone else that you are assigned to meet? Because in turn, the kingdom of God refills you and adds all things to you. Are you understanding how this desired things work? We're chasing material things, money, houses, cars, women, men, relationships, whatever, not knowing that if we ever get the kingdom, God adds all of those things. We become a servant in the world to others. And when God sees us serving what he has given us, then he turns around and adds it back to us. And here's the thing I love about God. He don't meet my desires. He overflows them. See, when I focus my mind on what the, how the kingdom functions and becoming a receiver of it and a giver of it, then I no longer have to worry about the desires being met. God is overflowing. It's amazing. Your wife will be turned on. Because God knows how to get in her mind. And you don't have to keep begging. Because as you do what you're supposed to do seeking the kingdom, God makes sure. Suddenly, she's going to have the hots for you. You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to walk in and she's going to be like, hey. What's up? How many men, y'all ain't lost your game, have you? You got your wife, you ain't lose your game? Please. You walk in the house and she's like, hey, you better know how to, what's up? What's happening? You don't know what, listen, see, when a person has this in them, things operate correctly. Can I keep going a little bit? I'm going to have to finish this next week. Let me get a little bit more in. See, we want to desire the things of God. We have to become more spiritually minded, but that only happens. How do desires develop? Well, you'd be, you be amazed at what people prefer over other things. And it's only because, like, where do your desires come from? I'll give you a couple of categories. Your desires are coming from cultural things. In other words, why do you like certain things over other things? 
It's not because it's, not it's spiritual. It's because you were born into that culture and that's their desires. You adopt their desires. Because you would desire something else if you were born into a different culture. It has nothing to do with you spiritually. So you want what they have trained you to want. You don't know you were trained that way because it happens early on. Desires are programs. They're just programs. Desires can be developed. Desires can change. Desires can increase in in, um, drive or they can lessen. Desires can move on the priority list. But you get your desires from things that you have been born into, number one. You know how, like if you're an American and you travel outside the country, like for me, sometimes I take little things with me to give me some familiarity of home even when I'm away. Why? It's because I desire that in the environment. I desire a taste of those things because it came from my home environment. That's why you desire it. So, so you can't just defend your desires as if they're always right. You might have just picked it up. Good or bad. Good or bad. Where else do the desires come from? If you get a taste of something. You know, it's very dangerous. See, that's why you got to watch your phone. You know what your phone is? It's a buffet to give you a taste of a lot of different worlds and a lot of different lifestyles and a lot of different forms of morality so that you can taste it. And then once you taste it, you'll desire it. Because if you taste it enough and you find something that is, is um, pleasing to your carnal man, that if that becomes a desire of yours and grows enough, you will chase it every day. So when you pick up your phone, you got to remember, this is a buffet trying to program me with a desire. And the only way to not want it is to make sure you're already satisfied. I hate to keep getting on the sex thing, but ladies, he won't want nothing if he's satisfied. If you want to help him with his desires, feed the lion. If a gazelle runs by a lion that just ate... He just, there's no temptation for things that you don't need. But if he's starving, if you go in the grocery store hungry, you buy everything. You eating the stuff before you even get to the line. I like when I start talking about the hard stuff, y'all go. All right, last point, last point, y'all okay? Last point. I have to pick up next time. So we hold all these different things because we have been exposed to them. So a desire is not proof of a calling or being right. I have to tell this to preachers sometimes. They say, I want to preach. I want to preach. Oh, I got a passion. I said, that doesn't mean you were called to preach. (gasps) But I got a desire. I don't know where you got it from. That doesn't mean that. I have a desire to sing. Well, that don't mean. I have a passion for it. Well, that don't mean anything. There's a lot of other things that we need to know and see before we can confirm that. You know what I'm saying? So, listen, a desire is not proof of a calling. Oh, I want to plant a church. That's not a desire you need to. I mean, that's not proof you need to. You can see now today I've laid this out. Everything you desire does not mean you're supposed to. People think desire is destiny. It's not. Write it down. Desire is not destiny. And many things I didn't want became destiny. I never asked God to be a preacher or plant a church. Never. And in fact, I didn't even think of it. God had to chase me down. And convinced me about a thousand different ways because I was okay with what I was doing for God. I was a pastor. I was on a staff of pastors at a good church. So I wasn't looking for nothing else. And that's the truth. Desire is not destiny. You will never achieve your your divine purpose if you think desire is destiny. There are other things we got to get into. People... Write these down. People desire things that they shouldn't desire because they're either misguided or they're chasing something evil and they have an appetite for it. Sometimes you're misguided. You didn't know you shouldn't not want that. 
But you got to answer these questions. Why do people desire, you know, spiritually, why do people desire miracles over knowledge? Think of this. Almost every person in here, if today was miracle service day, boy, we'd be throwing babies, waving hankies, right? We desire the miracle. We desire a sign. We desire a wonder instead of a key. We, desire, we don't want knowledge. You know why? Because I'm not really into the process of learning. I don't really want to have to have a discipline. God wants disciples, not customers. So churches are supposed to be filled with people that ain't in a hurry, ready to learn, staying in God's presence because it takes time to learn, but you can get delivered in an instant. So we'd rather, I would say, wait a minute now, there's a shortcut to this? I can get delivered in an instant? Yes, but you won't get any knowledge. And deliverance doesn't mean you're going to be able to keep whatever you got delivered from. So if you get delivered and you go right back out there to the same devil, you get it again. When the demon leaves, he rounds up seven others stronger than himself and returns to the place. And he says, I'm going back to my home where I was before. Because even though the house is put in order and swept and put together, there was no new tenant moved in. So you have to move in some knowledge and you have to move in some speed. You can't just keep going miracle service, deliverance service. Please hurry up, pastor. Why do we desire these quick things instead of substantial things? If you beat something with knowledge, you can beat it when it returns. See, when you, you're not a victor. You're not a victor because you got delivered. You're only a victor when you know how you got delivered. Because it can come back. If you got lucky one time or you got delivered one time, you don't know what happened. But if you get a key of the kingdom, you can unleash that authority when you need it. Why do people want money but not work? The idea of socialism is I want money but no work. Quiet in here. Well, I hate to tell you the Bible's against that. Man, don't work, don't eat. Condemns laziness. Condemns sleepiness. Gives us the symbolism of an ant who has no master over him but stays busy preparing. Mm -mm -mm. We want the reward but no work. Why do we desire that? Why do we want money but no wisdom? Why do we want money but no better ideas? Which one should you want? You should desire wisdom and ideas because money will follow that. Solomon said, I just want the wisdom. God said, I'll give you the money too then. What do we want though in society? We don't want wisdom. I don't need no wisdom. Just give me some money. Why do we want sermons but we don't want to be a part of a church? And I'm not talking about anybody online who might be sermon surfing right now. Why do we do that? Why do you want a sermon but no commitment? Why do you want churches to keep bending over backwards but you won't come? Y'all, that is an inappropriate, unholy desire. Any relationship that is one-sided is not right. That's called customer, consumerism. You have to become part owner of the mission that you are part of. Contributor, engaged. That's why the local church is important. Churches don't need customers. Some churches have settled for that. But that's, now they have to satisfy the customer or the customer leaves. But what God is trying to raise up is people who want to be part of a mission and not just get another sermon. Because what if your marriage is good and I'm talking about fixing marriages, and you're like, he ain't talking about what I like to talk about today. But your neighbor might need this desperately. You should be willing to sit here as a part of the mission and say, whatever my neighbors are in need of, I'm here to help with. Maybe you don't need to praise today, and your neighbor can't even get their hands up. They feel so condemned. Maybe you need to praise God so that your neighbors can be set free today. But you know, I'm tired, child, today. I stayed up all night last night. I don't feel, see, you're not, people are not on missions with churches. They just go to churches. They just want to hear another sermon. We don't care about the mission, Pastor. If this church dies, I'll go to the next one and drain that one. 
God's not looking for that. Look at your neighbor and say, God is not looking for that. And you shouldn't want that. You shouldn't desire that. You should find a place you can sink your teeth into. Jump in and start get, engaging it and be a part of the mission, not just a sermon hearer. Because churches need everybody on board. This is a battleship, not a cruise liner. Where the few people serve the guests. No, this is a battleship where we are all in stations ready to go. And I'm giving you bullets and equipment so you can go into this world and do damage to the darkness out in the world. I'm not here to serve you another. Would you like some ice cream with your brownie? I'm not here for that. You got to think, why do we want this? Why do we want this? You mean to show up at your house every week and just ask for food? And never bring you no groceries? Some of y'all got kids laying up on you now that are grown-ups. My house burnt down one time, y'all. My house has burnt down twice, actually. My house burned down one time years, years and years ago. This is before I was married. I had to go back to my mom's house for, the, for like three or four weeks. They were re, it was just a kitchen, so it wasn't the whole house. They were redoing the kitchen. So while I was there, I went to work every day. I stayed out of her way. I came home with groceries and money for the three weeks that I was there. And as soon as my, t- my house was re- renovated again, I moved out. Why do you want to stay and lay up on folks and not contribute? Y'all, that is a devil. Laying up on folks. Ain't nobody else got no relatives like that but me. I know y'all ain't never seen nobody like that. Some of y'all are like, I don't know. But seriously, though, I mean, I'm going to finish in a minute. But seriously, seriously, why do we want to do that? If that's how you think, you need to check that. You need to check that because desires lead to sin. Sin will lead to destruction. Your family members, y'all going to hate each other after a while because your grandmama don't want to keep taking care of your children while you clubbing. She don't. She's just a grandma. She ain't got nothing to say. Go get your kids. There ain't no churches like this nowhere else. They too nice to people. Let me smile. I was, I'm just trying to get to this landing place here. But you're all okay, right? Prophecies over training. You know, I was looking at this, this study the other day. We do a bunch of studies on, on our digital outreach that we do. And I find that people... The channels that are blowing up the most in terms of outreach, in terms of sermon, um, YouTube and stuff like that with, uh, you know, people that have like channels for, for that. You know what? It's always people promising people like prophecy over real biblical training. And I saw this one like now when we log on, we don't have that many. We have enough, believe me, but we don't have as many. So I seen this one lady. She was on there and she had like 2000 viewers following her and I was like what's she talking about so I turned it on and she was like your name is Wilma your name is Wilma and you are yes yes God is he, yes God is touching your foot right now that foot was hurting your name and who knows if there was a Wilma watching we don't know but there's people in the comments just ignorant for them. oh girl that's powerful how do you know And then I noticed she never said anything substantial the whole time. She just kept naming names, and she kept doing that. She's got a big following. You know why? Because the the desire for prophecy. Oh, I hope they say my name today. When I was a baby Christian, I sat in a Benny Hinn rally, y'all. A baby Christian. No, I like Benny. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm telling you about me. I was sitting in the rally. I'm just a baby Christian. I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I was, he was walking by, and the prophecy is real. Now, I'm not telling you it's not. I'm telling you people build ministries off of stuff. They just lied to you because they know you just want a deliverance of prophecy. Somebody say your name. So he's walking by, and he's prophesying and whatever, and I just for some reason, I was like, I hope he calls my name. You ever been sitting in a rally? You say, I hope the Lord got a word for me. 
Oh, I hope the Lord. You come to here sometimes and say, I hope the Lord, the Lord got a word for me. Maybe you just come here because it's your responsibility to come. Maybe God ain't going to say nothing direct. I ain't going to call your name out. Susie, it's your day. It's your day if you made it. It's your day if you got in God's presence. He got something for you. I might not say your name or know you came in. Why do we want these things? It's because we are empty. Dry and weary souls in the church. Dry bones. Withered. Malnourished. Play me something, guys. Dried up. Desperate. Hungry and thirsty. Give me a prophecy. Deliver me, Lord. Deliver me, Lord. All of those things are real and true, prophecies. But guys, that is the invitation to the relationship. That's not the relationship. That's not the relationship. God can't keep doing this for you. You're never going to reign over your troubles if you don't understand the kingdom. And you're never going to understand it until you seek it. Seek it until it's like air and you need to breathe. You have to seek it like even if you didn't want it that day and you didn't have a very specific unction from God that you just know, I got to get to it though. I have to put that as a priority. You don't want to wait until you're dry every time to go get something to drink. You want to drink out of habit. You want to you wanna, uh, you wanna get yourself hydrated before you feel the cramp. Because by then it's going to lock you up and it's hard to bring you back. Hey, Start checking your desires. Why do I want so many unbiblical things? Prophesy to me, pastor. Lay hands on me, pastor. Give me another altar call, pastor. Give me another sermon, pastor. Cut it off in 30 minutes, pastor. That's why we have child care, so you can sit here. They playing games. They ain't thinking about you. We taught them a lesson, then we give them some games and some crackers, and that's it. I don't know what they give them, actually. I know they take care of them. Crackers? Oh, Pastor Nurse there. Okay. Something. Can I pray for you? Man, I feel like I've been going a long time, but. Hey, I don't know if you're mad at me or not in terms of how long this is taking, but guys, some of y'all are just so empty. I know that feeling. It's a terrible feeling. living empty you keep making bad decisions some of y'all need God you need to stop all the busyness of life just everything after you and get with God so this is what I'm going to do for today I'm going to dismiss you guys this is is not for everybody but I want the sound team just to play me something so it's not for everybody, and, and don't feel bad if you are good and you can go. But you can use your chair. You can just turn around in your seat. You can come down to the altar, whatever. But I just want to pray for you. Can everybody stand up? You can't keep going around in life with unmet desire. You need God to fill you. You need God to fill you. You need to stop wanting those things. Stop wanting such an easy way out. Stop running from it. Stop. You, you just got to stop. Stop being offended at everything that's good. If you want to come down to the altar, come on down. And I'm going to pray and dismiss, but you can go ahead and start moving out of your chairs or you can turn around at your chairs. Lift your hands in this house. Let me bless you. Oh, Lord in heaven. Oh, Lord in heaven. Oh, Lord in heaven. You comfort the broken. You feel the dry and weary souls. Oh, God desperation we've made decisions out of desperation desperate desires to fill needs that only you can feel holes that are in our spirits un- feelings of vulnerability and, and uncoveredness lord and so god we are here and we don't want to rush in your presence god there are bad decisions being made there are decisions that have been made that need to be reversed god But without you, Lord, we won't have the strength to continue. We won't have the strength or the wisdom to know what to do. So, God, we just declare over your people today.
Lord, fill the dry and empty places. Lord, I just pray that a saturation of your spirit would overwhelm anyone who is feeling that feeling today. That they would start feeling satisfaction. The satisfaction of the spirit of God. Heal the broken places, Lord. And for those in here that you feel like everything is okay, God, I just pray that you would give them a great keenness and awareness and discernment to manage their desires, keep those desires where they should be, know the difference in the righteous desires of Christ and the desires that need to be put down and crucified. Man, I feel this thing. So, Lord, we just bless your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, the altars are going to be open. We're going to play some music in the house. If you need to come here or hang around in the lobby, I mean in the sanctuary, feel free to do that. Everyone else, you are free to go. Next week is the anniversary. We will have seating and overflow, so don't worry about the building being too packed. Just get here, okay? We'll be ready for you. God bless you. Have an amazing, fulfilled week. In Jesus' name, amen.